Good morning. Good morning. Taking up a point raised last night about the phrase used just after the fraction of the holy gifts when the portion of the lamb is placed in the chalice, I notice that the phrase we were discussing is translated as follows in the translation recently put out in Britain by the Russian Diocese of Suraj, translation of the Divine Liturgy in so-called traditional English, um, and a number of people had a hand in preparing this, among them myself. And here we simply say, the fullness of the Holy Spirit. So the word, the phrase, the fullness of faith of the Holy Spirit, of faith is omitted. And I think this was based on the um, recent edition of the liturgy published in Greek by the monastery of Simonos Petras which reflects the liturgical studies of Professor John Fundulis. So we just say the fullness of the Holy Spirit, and we leave of faith out altogether. At least that makes sense. This translation, incidentally, um, has made an attempt to rethink a number of familiar phrases in the accepted English translations of the liturgy, because often I think the accepted English translation is not, in fact, altogether accurate. For example, the normal translation we are familiar with, at any rate, in England in the Great Litany after praying for the civil authorities, we say, usually for this city, for every city and land, and for the faithful who dwell in them. Now, the word for land there is the Greek kora, which is a general word meaning place. So it can mean land, but does it mean land in that context? We've prayed for the whole world, we've prayed for the civil authorities of our country, we then pray for our city or monastery. I think we're working downward from the general to the more particular. So Hora here doesn't mean land, it means any place which is less than a city. So the translation we've used is for this city, for every city, town, and village. Well, that's just one example where we've tried to get behind the conventional translations to something that we believe to be more accurate. Actually, the Russian diocese, with, as I say, the cooperation of a number of people, uh, has now produced texts of the liturgies in Basil, the liturgies of pre-sanctified, matins, and vespers. So there's, there's quite a body of texts now, and these are the translations that I use with some emendations. For example, I they say here reasonable worship without shedding of blood in the epiclesis, that is a defensible translation, but I myself would say spiritual worship without shedding of blood. Admittedly, the Greek is logikos, not pneumatikos, but I think reasonable in modern English conveys the wrong sense. Um, do be reasonable, Felix. Um, I recall my uh, professor when I was an undergraduate, taught, he was a professor of philosophy, talking to his young son, aged four, who was um, making a great noise because he was being taken away from a party and he wanted to stay. I remember him saying, do be reasonable, Felix. Well, uh, 
philosophy is not to always get through when you're four years old and want to stay at a party. But, um, but that's what reasonable means. So you might say it's fudging the thing to say spiritual, but I think it conveys the sense better. However, that's where I disagree with them. But I wouldn't agree with anybody over everything. Now, I've decided slightly to recast my talks for today. So perhaps I'll write up the new titles to avoid confusion. This morning, instead of the title announced, I shall take as my theme with fear of God, preparing for Holy Communion. So that's what we are doing in session four. And then I thought that I would include, though it's moving out a little from my main theme, a talk about the sacrament of confession, which often, though not always, forms part of people's preparation for communion, and which does raise a lot of questions. So the talk this afternoon will be um, on that theme and I've called it the house of the physician, capital P, confession as a mystery of inner healing. And what we do for this evening's session, we must wait and see. I don't know what I'm going to say until I've said it, after all. So, preparing for communion. I would like to put before you, first of all, a, an image from Scripture the spirit in which we should approach, and then to suggest two basic guidelines and to work forward from that. My image from Scripture is from the book of Exodus, chapter 3, Moses before the burning book. As Moses approaches the burning bush, God says to him two things. First, speaking from the bush, he says, take off your shoes. And secondly, he says, the place where you are standing is holy ground. Let us apply that to ourselves. As we approach the fire of the Holy Eucharist, the first thing we must do is spiritually to take off our shoes. Interpreting these words, take off your shoes, St. Gregory of Nyssa says, shoes are made of leather. That is to say, from the skins of a dead animal. And so, taking off your shoes means, spiritually, stripping off from yourself the deadness of familiarity. 
stripping off boredom, a sense of repetitiveness. That is surely a spiritual problem for very many of us. Our problem is not perhaps that we are deliberately malicious, though we probably are some of the time, but our problem often is that we are rather bored and that we are using only a very small part of our spiritual resources. We are not alert. Our eyes are half closed in slumber. And there is a real danger that because of familiarity, because we have been priests for many years, we no longer feel the wonder and the mystery of what we are doing in the divine liturgy. So, approaching communion as priests, but the same applies to lay people. The first thing is to strip off the boredom, the sense of repetitiveness, the sense that this is all just the same as what we've been doing in the past, to wake up. Now, if you take off your shoes, what happens? You will feel the ground under your feet. You will feel the blades of grass and the formation of the earth. And that is also what happens if spiritually we strip off the boredom, the deadness of familiarity. So, freeing ourselves of boredom, we feel we are standing on holy ground. God is here at this moment with us, before us, within us. So there is an image for the spirit in which we should approach the celebration of the Divine Liturgy and Holy Communion. Take off your shoes. The place where you are standing is holy ground. Now for my two guidelines. And these are summed up in... First, the phrase used by the deacon, inviting the people to come forward for Holy Communion with fear of God, with faith and love, to draw near. That, at any rate, is the form we say it in the Greek tradition. Sometimes in the Slav tradition, a rather shorter version is used. So that's my first guideline. With fear of God, with faith and love, draw near. And my second guideline is summed up in the phrase, the holy gifts. With fear of God, with faith and love. Staretz Ambrosi of Optina says that throughout our Christian life, up to the very gates of death, we are always between fear and hope. And that could apply also to the spirit in which we approach for Holy Communion. We are to feel simultaneously contrasting sensations. First, we are to feel fear, fear of God, which doesn't mean blind terror, but it means a sense of awe and wonder. But we are also to feel, on the other side, faith in the sense of trust, not theoretical belief, but loving and humble trust. We feel fear 
because of our sinfulness. Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come beneath the roof of my soul. That is one of the things we say in the prayers of preparation. And again, in the office of preparation, we read the words, draw near with fear, lest you be burned. It is fire. But we are also to feel joy as well as fear. In the prayer, poetic prayer attributed to uh, Simeon the New Theologian in sometimes in the books, though probably not actually by him, we say, rejoicing at once and trembling, I who am straw receive the fire and see strange wonder, I am refreshed ineffably with dew. Like the bush of old, the burning bush, which burnt with fire, yet was not consumed. So here are the double feelings that the Christian, the Orthodox Christian, experiences as he approaches the holy mysteries. We feel trembling because we are straw, but we rejoice because we receive the fire and we are not consumed, but the fire transfigures us. So here then is a first guideline. If I approach for Holy Communion, it is not because I trust in my own righteousness but solely and exclusively because I trust in the love of God. If I approach for Holy Communion, it is because I am invited, because Christ himself says to me, draw near. Then my second guideline summed up in the phrase, the Holy Gift. Communion is always a gift. It's never something that we can claim as our right. It is always a free gift of divine love. Never something that we have earned, that we deserve. We cannot possibly earn or deserve the gift, but we should nonetheless prepare ourselves. But the purpose of the preparation is not to make us worthy. Sometimes people say, I couldn't go frequently to communion. I am not worthy. I must prepare carefully. Well, whatever the arguments for or against frequent communion, that is a bad reason. If we imagine that by going infrequently and by fasting and saying a great many prayers, we make ourselves worthy, that is a total misunderstanding of the nature of the preparation. We cannot ever be worthy of the gift of the body and blood of Christ. It is always a free gift of his love, not because of our worthiness. So what is the purpose of preparation? Not to make me worthy, for that I can never be. But the purpose of the preparation is to make me realize that I am unworthy. The purpose of the preparation is to help me to discern, to appreciate what I'm about to do, to raise the level of my self-awareness. But it doesn't make us worthy. So here we have a strange paradox. Those who think they are worthy should not approach for communion, because they're in a state of delusion. 
the only ones who may approach for communion are those who think they are not worthy. If you think you are worthy, stay away. But if you think you are not worthy, but you trust in the love of God and in his saving power, then you may draw near. So we come to communion not because we are worthy, not because we are saints, but because we are sinners and because we need the help that only the Holy Eucharist can give. I remember this point being emphasized by the Russian theologian Vladimir Lossky, who died in 1958. He used to receive communion every week at a time when that was unusual in uh, the Russian church. He followed the discipline of the Russian church. He went every Saturday for confession and then every Sunday for communion. And I remember him discussing the question that arises in our minds often when we read the lives of the saints, especially the saints who dwelt in the desert, that they seem to have gone often for many years of their lives without ever having communion at all. St. Anthony of Egypt, in the life of St. Athanasius, spends 20 years in a deserted fort, meeting no one. And it isn't said by Athanasius that the priest came out and gave him communion. Well, it's always dangerous to argue from silence. In fact, the Holy Communion, the Eucharist, is never once mentioned in the whole of that classic text, the life of Antony by Athanasius. But the obvious implication is he met no one. He did not receive communion in that period. And this is the way Losky explains this. He says, yes, if you or I were a great saint like St. Antony of Egypt, Perhaps it would be sufficient for us to receive communion once, and that would last us for 20 years. But if you and I are not a great saint like that, we need to go often to communion. So there he reverses the usual idea that the saints can go frequently, but we can't. On the contrary, perhaps the saints can keep going on provisions for 20 years for one communion. But that's not our path, or at least not mine. So in preparation, this I think should be our true attitude. And let me now give two specific examples from the Gospels. First, on the Sunday after next, at any rate in the Greek use, we shall be reading the Gospel of the Canaanite Woman. There's a lot of confusion this year what to do with the Sundays between Epiphany and the beginning of Lent, because there are too many of them, and the rules don't allow for so many Sundays as this. Um, probably this is the effect of keeping the new calendar for the fixed feasts, but the old calendar for Pascha, um, insofar as the old calendar affects the date of Pascha, which it does. This year, for example, if we kept um, the date of Pascha strictly by the new calendar, it would be much earlier. However, what do we do about the different Sundays? Last Sunday was... Um, Zacchaeus for you, but it wasn't for me. Um, I kept Zacchaeus a week earlier, so you never quite know what's going on. <laughs> but I'm looking at the calendar that we produce in England for the new style, um, which we try to give people daily scripture readings, because I found when I said to people, read scripture every day, they say, but the calendars we buy only tell us what to read on Sundays. So here we've got 
um, uh, um, everyday readings, and I tried to put in lots of Celtic saints um, uh, to... Uh, well, you we could all buy this uh, calendar, promote our sales. Mm. Uh, I haven't got any copies with me at the moment. But for example, uh, yesterday, the 6th, it was uh, St. Mile, Bishop of Ardagh, disciple of St. Patrick. And today we've got St. Richard of the West Saxons. And a bit later on, Saturday, St. Tylo, Bishop of Landaf and Landilo IV. And so it goes on. Um, and in the coming week, we've got several abbots of Lindisfarne. So we try to put some of them in there. So then, attitude for coming to Holy Communion. The Canaanite woman. Matthew 15, 21 to 28. She asserts no claim when she comes before Christ. She has no demands. She does not insist on any right. She's not a Jew. She's not a member of the chosen people. All she does is appeal for help. Appeal to Christ's compassion. Appeal for mercy. All she says is, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. Lord, help me. And that should be our attitude when coming for Holy Communion. Not asserting claims, not demanding rights, but simply trusting in God's mercy. And the second scripture example is the thief on the cross. He again asserts no claims. On the contrary, he says, we indeed have been condemned justly for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. He simply asks Christ to remember him. Lord, remember me when thou comest in thy kingdom. That again should be our attitude of the thief on the cross. Simply putting ourselves on the mercy of Christ. And the conclusion I would draw from all this is when you receive a gift that you don't deserve, what is your reaction? And surely our reaction is joyful gratitude. And that should be exactly our attitude over receiving communion. Now let's come to a different point frequency of communion. If this is the spirit in which we should prepare, then how often should we receive the sacrament? How frequently should we say to Christ, at thy mystical supper today, receive me as a communicant? How frequently should we say today? There is an interesting answer to this question about frequency of communion given in the seventh century by St. Anastasius of Sinai. When asked how often people may come, St. Anastasius says, there are some people who may receive communion every day. There are some people who may receive communion once a week. Others may receive once a month or once a year. And there are some people who should never come to communion at all. Now, the point which St. Anastasius is making is surely this. It is not possible to give a single external rule applicable mechanically to everybody. It all depends on each person's inner state, on their personal, moral, and spiritual situation. 
So I'm not going to give you a single rule today. But I feel we should always bear in mind two dangers to be avoided. Overemphasis on preparation and underemphasis on preparation. In past centuries, there has been overemphasis on preparation, with the result that in most parts of the Orthodox Church, people only came for Holy Communion three or four times a year, lay people. But perhaps today, in certain parts of the Orthodox Church, the danger is underemphasis on preparation. An overemphasis on preparation leads us to an excessive sense of our unworthiness. And then we build up barriers around the sacrament, and the result is infrequent communion. Now, I think we're all sensitive to the dangers there. But are we sensitive enough to the dangers on the other side? If we fail to teach our people the need for preparation, the result may be casualness and over-familiarity, loss of the fear of God. I am in favor of frequent communion, but I am not in favor of casual communion. We come to communion because we need the grace of God, but we must not advocate cheap grace. In our society, everything is sold at cut price, 25% discount. You will see that everywhere. Um, everything is concentrating on time-saving gadgets, making things cheaper and easier. And that must not be our attitude towards the Christian life. Holy Communion should never become something automatic, never be taken for granted. We do not just come and help ourselves. Some time ago, an um, English Orthodox convert said to me, of course I go to communion every time I go to the liturgy. What would be the point of going to the liturgy if I didn't go to communion? I find that attitude very dangerous. I'm rather old-fashioned, and I still believe there is a place for non-communicating attendance at the liturgy to help us realize that it is a gift. But however frequently we go, let us ensure that Holy Communion is always an event, a happening. Never something that we simply take for granted automatically, but always something to which we specially look forward. Our attitude towards communion should be one of eager expectation. As with Zacchaeus, climbing up his sycamore tree, and communion should be something to which we specially look back with a sense of festal joy. We don't just go out of the church and forget all about it. It should be something that stands out in our memory. Now, let me say in this context a few words about preparation. As we all know, there are three main ways in which we prepare. The first is through the use of special prayers. The second is through fasting. And the third, though not always before communion, in at any rate the Greek and I'm sure in the Antiochian tradition, we may prepare through going for confession. Um, now, I shan't say much about the prayers, 
because you'll know all about that, about the canon before communion, the three psalms, and the twelve or sometimes eight prayers. What I say to my spiritual children is you should not interpret the provision for the prayers in an absolutely legalistic sense. There may be occasions when you haven't been able to say all the prayers. That would not necessarily be a reason against receiving communion. We should certainly say some of that office for preparation, but I don't see it as an absolutely fixed measure. But some of you may think that is too lax. However, I notice in the prayer book that I use, a manual of Eastern Orthodox prayers, it's an edition published many years ago by the Fellowship of St. Auburn and St. Sergius with the blessing of Archbishop Germanos of Thyatira, the Greek Archbishop. I notice there in the preparation it says, should the time for preparation be short, the following prayers should at least be said. Then it mentions two prayers to be said at home and two in church. Now that, I think, is taken from the Russian books. So, yes, we should say the prayers, and the more we can say, the better. But we shouldn't impose it as an absolute measure. There can be situations where you do not need to say every prayer every time. What about fasting? Well, we all know that on the day itself when we're to receive communion, in the morning we should not eat and drink unless there are strong medical reasons why that is difficult, in which case we would seek the guidance of our spiritual father or parish priest. What is the purpose of this immediate pre-Eucharistic fast? It is exactly, on my understanding, to produce a within us a sense of eager expectation. If the Holy Sacrament is the first food you receive in the day, this has gives it a special character. I don't myself say fast from midnight, because in the orthodox understanding of time, midnight doesn't have any special significance. What I would say is, eat and drink nothing from the time you wake up. If a person has had to be out late on Saturday evening, they haven't been able to eat, they come back and say, oh good, it's 10 to 12, I can have something to eat. Or, oh dear, it's three minutes past 12, I can't eat. I don't think that is the correct approach. I think that if for legitimate reasons you've not been able to eat, you come home very late, well, all right, make yourself a bowl of vegetable soup, something very light, and have that to give you strength. So it's more nothing in the morning, rather than looking at your watch to see whether it's midnight. I don't know what the rule is in the Antiochian church as regards evening liturgies. In the Patriarchate of Constantinople and in the Patriarchate of Moscow, the rule is six hours of abstinence from food and drink. But I say to people, calculate that from the time of communion. <laughs> okay. So if you're going to pre-sanctified liturgy, we start the pre-sanctified liturgy at Oxford at about six o'clock, and it would be around eight by the time we got to the time for communion. So I say, all right, <laughs> um, you could have um, a light, light refreshment, some fruit juice, some uh, soup in the middle of the day at one o'clock. And the same for Easter midnight. Uh, we start the matin service at about 11 in Oxford. 
uh, an hour before midnight, actually. Um, and then I suppose the, it's, it's, it's pretty well about half past two, but by the time we get to the communion, um, uh, we, we do things rather slowly, perhaps. Um, then I say, well, calculate from the time of communion, so you can have something in the early evening. Apart from this practice of a pre-Eucharistic fast, I am not aware of any holy canon that prescribes otherwise a specific fast before communion. And so to those who are practicing weekly communion, I would say it is enough to keep the fasts of the church's year, Wednesday, Friday, and the major feasts. But on Saturday evening, eat lightly and simply if you're going to have communion the next day. It's true that, for example, St. Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain in the early 18th century said that you should have three days fasting without oil, and that's often repeated in Greek circles. But this was advice he gave to people who had not been com to communion for many months. He himself was in favor of frequent communion, by which he meant for monastics daily communion. But um, when he said three days without oil, that was for people who perhaps hadn't been to communion for years. Though that rule has somehow become isolated. And we shouldn't apply it generally. It's interesting that St. Nicodemus and the circle he belonged to, the so-called Colivades, they were fiercely attacked for their teaching about frequent communion. A major controversy on Mount Athos, many of them were driven out from the Holy Mountain. But eventually... This was after St. Nicodemus' death. The Holy Synod at the Patriarchate of Constantinople justified St. Nicodemus and the Colivades in a decision made in 1819. And then it was said that in principle, the faithful may receive communion at every celebration of the liturgy. Whether they do actually receive communion depends on their spiritual state, their preparation, the blessing of their spiritual father, of their abbot or abbot. But in principle, said the Holy Synod, at every liturgy, the celebrant speaking in Christ's name says, draw near. So in principle, any Christian who is prepared and has a blessing may draw near. That's quite a surprising decision for the early 19th century. I praise God for it. Now, I'd like to say just a few words about confession, and then I'll continue after words in the early afternoon by saying a bit more. Of course, Confession is a sacrament in its own right. It's not simply a preparation for communion, though that's what it's become in many parts of the Orthodox Church. So far as I know, there is no church canon that specifies that a person must go to confession before every communion. As we know, it is the custom in the churches of Russia, Romania, Bulgaria, and Serbia to require confession before every communion. And this creates immense problems in Russia today where people are going more frequently for communion, that you may have to wait three or four hours in order to have your confession heard. And that's difficult if you've got to do that every Sunday. I notice in the Russian church in the West, 
um, apart from the Russian church abroad, it's not required usually that you should make your confession before every communion. As far as I can discover, in Byzantium and in the Greek tradition, confession was never obligatory before each communion. I believe the same is true of the Arab tradition, but I don't know. I'd be very interested to know how this custom grew up in the Slav and Romanian churches. Somebody needs to do research here. But it's very interesting in, for example, the life of St. Mary of Egypt. She led a very sinful life. She repents, prays all night, goes next morning, receives communion, goes out into the desert. But it's nowhere said that she went to confession. Well, clearly in this, I say to people there to be guided by their parish and diocesan practice and by the rule of their spiritual father. I had a spiritual father as a layman who was in the Russian church abroad, though I myself was in the Greek church, but for the seven years that I was a layman in the Orthodox church, I never went to communion without going first for confession. So I was brought up in that pattern. Of course, once you are ordained, even in the Russian tradition, it's different. You do go to communion without confession each time. My own advice to prospective converts in catechesis is that they shouldn't go for confession more than once a month unless they have something very specific to confess. Confession shouldn't be trivialized by becoming too repetitive. But in some cases, I do say they perhaps don't need to go as often as once a month, though I would see four to six times a year as a minimum. I also say to prospective converts, though I know many priests would <laughs> differ from me, I suggest to them that they don't receive communion every Sunday at first, because I see value in non-communicating attendance. I suggest that they go... Um, on each alternate Sunday. But usually I find after a few months they say to me, can't we go more often? And I say, all right. But I think it's better to start with less and do more rather than to start with a very high ideal and gradually to fall away from it. Now let me, in conclusion to what I'm saying this morning, raise the question, why go to confession? And this is a question that increasingly I found catechumens do ask me. And those who've been brought up, particularly in a Protestant background, find often the whole idea of confession very troubling. So how do we answer the question why go to confession? This is the end of side one.